Hi, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Well, I know. I won't go, I won't go there. So, happy Tuesday. <laughs> happy Fat Tuesday. Happy, fat happy Tuesday. Mardi Gras. Tomorrow's Ash Wednesday. Yes. So, the service at St. Andrew is at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening. That's right. Right? Yeah. So, today's the last day that you could eat all the junk you want if you're giving up some junk for Lent. <laughs> yes, whatever it is. Today's, yeah, today's yeah. the last it's day. It's also Pancake Day. I noticed Pan which of Shrove course Tuesday. we always have Shrove Tuesday. Shrove Tuesday, a Pancake Day. I'm sure I hop in, you know, original Pancake House are taking advantage of that. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I don't know what the meaning is of the fact that the State of the Union address is on Fat Tuesday. But I think it just fell that just way. Just kind of happened that yeah. way, huh? Yeah. No, no deep meaning. I should read into I that. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. So one other thing, of course, is that um, this Sunday is communion, and we're going to do communion the old-fashioned right. old fashioned way. way. Yes, yes, yes. We're going back. So Patty got an email the other day asking about uh, of the various communion servers who was who was still in the game so we're going to serve on sunday at 9 30 and um yeah that, that, that'll be really good yes be really and good and like one of the more um i don't know tangible things tangible that, things that things are getting and we're imposing closer. ashes tomorrow yes. at at 7 p.m so yes. it i did notice though that it did say yesterday in the in the weekly update that if people cannot make it mm -hmm. it will also be online i mean you will not get actually your ashes but the whole service will be yes online the service tomorrow. you know we pretty much do that with everything now and you know our own our own lauren because most of you love her like we do she's going to be given the message tomorrow night yes which she is, is. she's which preach is on ash wednesday big she's you know she's done a number of them on um saturday nights um so this is just this is just great that she's actually going to be preaching in the sanctuary and it is yeah it is indeed all right so anyway it's beautiful okay. out it's beautiful out it's lovely out it's going to get warm more it's supposed to be 80 on saturday whoa Whoa, right then, what he said last night, 79 on Friday. Wow. Every day is getting a little bit warmer. Wow. So I'm sure we'll probably cool off a little bit sometime, but, you know, it's warming up. Before you know it, you know, what'll be what'll be happening? We'll be complaining how hot it is. <laughs> it will be. That's what'll happen. That's just, that's life in Texas, baby. Yep. All right. It is. Shall I open us up with prayer? I'm looking right now. It is 12.03. I think that's... Yeah, we've bantered long enough. Bantered long enough, yes. That's all they can take, really. <laughs> it's all anybody can take. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here on this Tuesday in a world filled with unusually heightened anxieties and apprehensions right now as storm clouds roll and war rages in Eastern Europe. We, we, can come, we are grateful we can come together this way to spend the next hour and 15 minutes or so um, immersed in your word, to hear Jesus' prayer today, and to know that his prayer can be our prayer as well. And um, we just are grateful, and we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and our minds to you so that we can um, become ever truer disciples of Jesus and rest free of anxiety in his arms. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All righty, I'm going across the way here. Okay. So here's where we are. We are going to begin today at John chapter 17, verse 1. That is the beginning of this prayer that Jesus prays at the end of this long discourse, this long talk that he has had with his um Disciples, I call it a discourse. It's usually called that because he does, he does all the talking. Like I said, if you had a red letter Bible, these chapters we've been in would be in all red ink because Jesus is the one who is talking about the Comforter and talking about um, the, his coming glory and God's glory and and so forth. And so a lot of those themes there are cap are picked up and captured in this prayer. So. As much time, as as many references as there are in the Gospels to Jesus praying, you would think we would have more of his prayers for us in the Gospel. 
we have the Lord's Prayer. We have the very brief prayer that he prays as he is calling Lazarus out of the tomb. But the longest prayer, by far, is John chapter 17. That's where we're going to start today. It is, um, you'll see in there, there's a place where Jesus refers to himself in the third person. You know, in the moment when Jesus is praying this, maybe not. Because as John is remembering this, it's clear that John took and over the years had prayed this himself many times, pieces of this. Indeed, Christians have. Um, you'll find pieces of this in many, in many Christian prayers. Um, but we get the opportunity to listen in on Jesus' prayer to the Father. And it's in basically three pieces. So the first piece is about the coming glorification of Jesus which will be to the glory of God, and that is referring to the cross. You know, the time has come. Um, in John's gospel, it's referred to his hour. Remember how many times we've heard Jesus say, my hour has not yet come. Well, it has come. And it will be to his glory and to the God's glory because Jesus' faithfulness all the way to death on that cross demonstrates God's love for us and for the world. And another famous verse from John's gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, so yes, that, because glory again is a social term. It is, glory refers to people seeing that God is who Jesus says God is and and sees the world can see um, the depth of God's love and the irony is that happens because Jesus is lifted up on a Roman cross for all the world to see. The second part um, that begins in verse 9 or so is a prayer for the disciples and 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 a prayer for them to a prayer of thanks for them, a prayer for their protection, a prayer for them to be holy, a prayer um, uh, recognizing that they are now really set against the world in important ways. And that will be true because many of them will be martyred. And then the final part of the prayer is the part where Jesus is praying for those who are not the immediate disciples around him, but will come to know Jesus. And of course, that includes who? Well, that includes you and me, right? We're not one of the Jesus' immediate circle of, of disciples 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, but we are part of the body of Christ and part of those whom Jesus will pray for in this prayer. So, you know, we get, it's a, it's, it's a privilege, and the prayer is serious. The prayer is, and we just have to sort of let it into our hearts as we, as we read, as we read through it. So, I'm going to start at chapter 17 in John's Gospel, verse 1. It's, I'll just set the stage for you a little bit in the right first part of this verse. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Now that is not how you and I typically pray. If you in most Christian settings, people pray, they bow their heads, maybe join their hands. The typical way to pray for a pious Jew of Jesus' day, and I think this happens still sometimes now, is that they will look upwards. They will look upward. And why does Jesus look upward as he prays? Because for these ancient people, God is where? God is up there. Go straight up. That's where God is. And so the prayer is directed to God, right? To the Father. 
And so Jesus looks upward in the way of his fellow devout, pious Jews would pray. And he says this. He says, Father, the hour has come. Indeed it has. The hour has come. The cross lies just ahead. The hour has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. That's what the, that's what the cross is about. The glorification of Jesus for the glorification of God. You will see Jesus' faithfulness on display. You will see God's love on faithful, God's love on display. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you, for you granted him authority over all people, that he may give eternal life to all those you have given him. So as Jesus does so often in all of the Gospels, he takes Jewish understandings about things and he focuses them upon himself. The place where Jews would talk about God and eternity and th these kinds of words, it, it would be the temple. That was the focal point. That was the place where God dwelt. That was, that, that was it. That's the heartbeat of the religion. But Jesus always is taking this and focusing it now upon himself. For you granted him, your son, he means himself, authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life. You might ask me, well, what does eternal life mean? That they, they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. See, there's this moment where he refers to himself here as Jesus Christ. Well, okay, that they may know you we think of eternal life as being an appendage on the end of a timeline, right? So we're born, we live, we die, we're, someday we'll be resurrected. Eternal life is at the end of this long timeline. But that, that isn't the way to think about it. Eternal life is a gift that is given to us when we come to faith in Christ, when we come to know Christ, when the Holy Spirit indwells our hearts, our being, we step into eternal life. Yes, our bodies will yet die at some point, but death will not hold us. We step into eternal life. It, it's one of those things that takes, that takes a, a shift, I think, in our minds and hearts, and it takes some imagination. But um, sometimes... Theologians will talk about it this way, that where we are headed is not a time or not an event. It is a who. It is Jesus. Put your focus on Jesus. He is, he is in essence, eternal life. This is eternal life, that they know you. Is it any wonder that we try to, we now, as we are making disciples, which Jesus charged us with in this life in 2022, is it any wonder that we are trying to help people come to know Jesus? Is it any wonder that it matters that they come to know the Jesus who is not some Jesus that's a figment of their own imaginations, like that guy in Miami a few years ago. He said he was Jesus for second coming. And all. No, you have, if you're going to trust someone, if you're going to put faith in someone, you have to know who that someone is. You don't have to know them perfectly, but you have to know them somewhat. <laughs> that's the essence of Christian doctrine, is to helping people grasp who Jesus is really is so that you're putting your faith in in the true Jesus because in verse 3 this is eternal life that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent and then Jesus prays I have brought you 
the Father, glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Earlier in the gospel, he's talked about being on his way toward finishing the work. Here he's talking about finishing the work just a few hours hence when he is on the cross and he is near death, he will say it is finished. God sent him here on a mission. Jesus had a vocation. That's a word I like a lot because it means a calling. Jesus was here on a mission to be that one faithful Jew who would simply love God and love others every day and in every way. And sure, of course, that is going to bring him to a Roman cross. That is not the way of the powers of this world, of the evil powers of this world, of the spiritual forces of wickedness that are still with us and are being played out right now in Ukraine. Verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Wow. Okay, so for those who wonder if Jesus existed before he was born to Mary or existed before the creation of this planet, the answer is yes. So you can take verse 5 and you can put it with the very opening words of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning. NRK in the Greek, in the beginning, just like Genesis begins, in the beginning. Yes, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but don't let that cloud your understanding that Jesus has always been, is now, and always shall be. And so he says in verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Either Jesus was who he said he was, or he was crazy. I mean, who says such things? Unless, one, that's true, or... You know, they wander around the streets with, you know, out of their minds. It's, it's people who say that Jesus never made such claims. I just think just haven't spent any time really reading their Bibles. They just, or they read them very superficially. That's a powerful, hard-hitting verse. Glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Verse six, verse 6, I have revealed you, right, the true God, the nature of the true God, God, God's way. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. Those are the disciples. They have been... <laughs> They have been Jesus' charge. They are Jesus' sheep. They are, they are the, the ones whom God has in, whom the Father has entrusted to Jesus so that Jesus could reveal to them the truth about God, about God's way, about the coming of the kingdom. He said, Jesus prays, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. The disciples writ large come off better in John's Gospel than in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the portrait is largely of their blindness. But here, Jesus commends them to God and says, you gave them to me. They have obeyed your word. They have been dot, dot, dot. They have been faithful to me. These are the people upon whom that, that, who at Pentecost will be indwelt by the Spirit and will go out and begin to do the work that God, that Jesus gives them to do, to make disciples, to be witnesses to Jesus. 
Verse 7. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you. And they believed, they trusted, they had faith that, yes, you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world. Remember, the world are the opponents. In, in, in these chapters in John, the world is, is the opponents. It's the leadership of it's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the rest. I pray for them, the disciples. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Scott, I have a quick yes. question. And yeah. I'm sorry, I probably should know this, but are they still in the upper room, or have they made their oh. way to the garden? They're not in the garden. No. Nope. Okay, so Are they walking along? Okay. I don't know. People okay. people will do it. I I think they're still in the room. Okay. I think he is it's just but it is a lot. It is a lot of talking. Yes. Cuz we've been in this for a right. few weeks right. now, right? Yeah. So, but John brings all this together, right? And um This is what Jesus tells his disciples in depth on the eve of his crucifixion. Okay. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine another way of talking about the identity between Jesus and the Father. Right? That when you see me, you see the Father. The Father and I are one, Jesus says elsewhere. All I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. Through the disciples. I will remain in the world no longer but they still are they are still in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. Again, name is not a label. A name, a name is about the power and authority of God. This is the only place in John's Gospel where Jesus uses the phrase, Holy Father. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them. And I kept them safe by that name you gave me. That name is a way, I think, of speaking of the authority that Jesus has been given um, and he has been able by the power of the Father, by the power of God to keep these disciples safe and he has brought the ministry, he's brought this work through two, two and a half, three years, right? When they were beset by a lot of enemies. I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost. Except who? The one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. And who is that? Judas. Yeah, that's the one who was lost. That's, 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 that's the, that's the bad sheep in the flock. So Jesus says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Remember, because Jesus has promised them that yes, he's going, they can't go with him, but he's going to send the Spirit after, the, the one who will be their advocate and their comforter and their counselor. How much do they really grasp of all of that? I don't know. But it's a huge promise, and it will come to fruition 
full fruition on Pentecost. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. So, he isn't saying they're like Jesus or something. They're not one with the... They're, you look at them, they and the Father are not one. But they have been transformed by coming to Jesus. They were once of the world, capital W, I guess, maybe, but now they are of Jesus. And so they're not really of the world anymore. When we come to faith in Christ, even today, in 2022, we become part of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And in important ways, we are no longer of the world. We are to be the light of the world. We're to, we're to shine a light. We're to be Jesus' witnesses. But, but we do not operate as the world operates anymore. We are set apart. The word Peter writes in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, you are a holy people, a holy people chosen by God, right? A holy people called out of the darkness so that you can proclaim God's mighty works. A holy people, that holy word is a set apart word. That's the essence of the word holy. Set apart, okay? Set apart. So these disciples have been set apart, and in that way, they are not of the world anymore. They are now with Jesus. I've given that verse 14. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world anymore than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Here we go. The evil one. To whom is Jesus referring? I think it's pretty clear if you take this and the other passages in the Gospels, Jesus is referring to the devil, to Satan, to the to this demon, this angel who chose against God and and works against God's purposes. And I've told you for a long time in my life, I just kind of sloughed all that stuff away and said, well, you know, no, there isn't really any devil. No, there really isn't any Satan. My mind was too, was too forced into the world's mode about things that exist or things you can touch and smell and see and the rest. But I was wrong, I think. I'm sure. I was wrong. And we I, we keep running into instances that, that tell me that no, there are spiritual forces of wickedness that work in this world. That we try to explain away or try to explain what's happening and we have trouble doing it. Why is what's happening in Ukraine happening right now? Why? Why? Is it merely that Putin is becoming mad or something? Or is it something else? I, I don't know. Perhaps he has just given himself over to evil acts so many times in, in his uh, assassination of political opponents, in his attempt to take over Georgia, in his taking of Crimea, and, and, and that it's sort of like he becomes the portrait of Dorian Gray without the portrait. It's just him now, and he has given himself over to the destruction of the good so often that now it is just his way, and he turns language upside down Evil becomes good and good becomes evil and light becomes dark and dark becomes light and his armies marching into Ukraine become peacekeepers as the rockets are firing. It's 
maybe it's more than just crazy. In any event, Jesus' prayer is that you not take the disciples out of the world. They, they will have work to do, right? You and I have work to do. The disciples will be given this work to do by Jesus after he's resurrected and before he returns to the Father. They are to go out and make disciples of all nations and teach them to obey Jesus' instructions. They are to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are to be wit Jesus' witnesses to the ends of the earth, proclaiming in word and deed who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and, and how Jesus' rescue has happened and what that means for how we are to live. So if they are going to remain in the world. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not. Sanctify them by the truth. Make them holy by the truth. Um, prepare them for this by the truth. Your word is truth. These are the kinds of verses that have made Christians as with, um, as the Jews before and today, so committed to the written word, to the sacred scriptures that are handed down to us. That the, the, these, as Paul puts it, they're, they're, they're God-breathed. They're where we go to begin understanding what the truth is. Otherwise, otherwise, we're left with our own opinions, what our own minds could come up with, and in the end, that's an exercise in raw power. In the end, that becomes just an exercise in raw power. No, that's, that's not how we do this. We, we, it's like, <laughs> I haven't thought about this verse in a little while, I guess. It's the last verse in the book of Judges. This, it in some ways it's like the it's like the most condemning verse in the entire Old Testament, which has a lot of condemning verses. Let me tell you, because the people are utterly faithless so much of the time. But it says, oh, everyone they had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And when everyone does what is right in their own eyes. It becomes about raw power. Could be nothing else. Who gets to pick? Who gets to choose? The strongest. Not the good, the strongest. So, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Big emphasis on holiness here. Big emphasis on, on, on being the people, God, being the disciples God has called them to be. Being set apart for God's work in this world, just as Jesus was set apart. Jesus had a vocation. They, had a, they have a vocation. You and I have a vocation. No Christian should ever wonder what their purpose in life is. I know that, who was it? Um, oh gosh, Rick Warren wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life, okay? God has given us a purpose. We are born with a purpose, or I guess I should say, when we are reborn in Christ, we have a purpose. If you feel like you don't know what God wants you to do in life, begin with this. God wants you to... Sorry, if you're looking at me, I'm having trouble with my eye. Um, God wants you to, do, to make disciples. To go out, to build the church, to build up the church, to be witness to Jesus and thought and deed, to think about how you present yourself to others. 
I saw a fellow I won't name on, on, on a viral video screaming and hollering at somebody and just just losing it completely all the time wearing a bright gold cross on his lapel. And I thought to myself, man, I realize self-control is difficult sometimes for some people, but self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. If you're going to lose it that way, just just take the pin off or something. I don't know. Anyway, we all have a purpose. God has given us a purpose. Don't think that God doesn't have a purpose for you. What you the the way you live that out or the way that works out for you um, may is going to be different than it is for Patty or for me or for anybody else. But there is always always work to be done to further. Um, to further, to build for the kingdom of God. Always work to be done. So, it's out there. So, Jesus has been praying for the disciples that he knows, that he loves, that have been with him through this, through this, um, whole time of, of, of ministry. So um, now he's going to turn and pray for all believers. So now this, it's going to go to what, remember John is writing, like this, putting this gospel together like 60 years after the fact. And so now in this prayer, Jesus is going to begin to pray for those who will come after. Like the, us. Like us. Yeah. Who will come after. The Christians of the later in the first century, in the second century, and now the 21st century. So, before I before we start at chapter verse 20, do you have anything to add, Patty? Anything you'd like to say? Anybody got anything? Nobody has put any messages. Like if Please, just put a comment or anything. I'll be so glad to read it out to Scott. What I just find so amazing about this, as you said, this is the longest prayer of Jesus and this is in his, um, you know, most stressful time, most stressful hour. He knows that the moment has come. And who is he thinking about? His disciples and us, that we'll be okay, that they'll be okay. And for God to equip us to be okay. Nothing about himself, nothing for himself. Just completely, 100%. He isn't, he isn't even Unselfish. praying to be relieved of this thing that's Nothing. about to happen. Nothing. He's praying for the people he loves. That's right. The disciples and the disciples who will follow, right? Yes. So, um, absolutely. I just thought of in the book of Acts, when at the, in the opening chapters, when the authorities are picking up Peter and James and John and the believers gather together and we're told they pray. What they pray for is not safety. They pray for boldness, that they will not shrink away from proclaiming um, the good news of Jesus Christ. They want to. They want to stay bold. They want to stay strong in that. Um, not not a prayer for their own safety, just as Jesus doesn't hear. Oh, sorry, Mona. Sorry, Mona. She said that the Facebook is not uh, matching up today with the yeah. video. So sorry. Well, maybe try it on face on an iPad or iPhone or, you know, um, yeah. So, I'm going to explore a different vehicle for doing this than Facebook Live. I don't know if the others are any better, but it is frustrating. It is frustrating, no doubt. I would like to talk with Mark Zuckerberg and ask him, really, how hard is this to do? <laughs> so. Yeah, Susan said yeah that's the way. Coming. That's the Facebook thing. You never know who's going to have problems, when or why. Yes. You're just almost like at the lottery. Yes. <laughs> Some people are okay and others are just not. So. And see, I can't even check, folks, because um, even though you hear me talking right now, when I'm sitting across the desk from Scott, he is about 20 seconds delayed on the video that I'm watching of him saying the words he said 20 seconds ago. So for me, it never matches up perfectly. Yeah, and so you're only going to be, you would only be, you would only be checking for yourself. 
Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Right? And, so yeah. Susan Susan Hauser is perfectly good. Mona is not. Don't get it. Okay. Like I said, get me an audience with Mark Zuckerberg. Yes. I'm sure he would take time for you, honey. He should. He should. <laughs> <laughs> he should. Heck, I'd, I'd pay for a service that was a little more reliable than it is. Anyway, all right. So Jesus is now going to pray for all believers. This includes you and me. My prayer, Jesus says, to the Father is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me, who will trust me through their message. Right, you get it. The me whose message? The message that the disciples are going to carry out. That all of them, all of the believers who are going to come in future days, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. This, I, this unity, 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 it is a constant theme for Paul. Our unity in Christ, our unity in Christ, rising above our, our, all the ways people want to divide us by gender or, or race or... Um, money or whatever it might be that people want to divide us into groups and shove us apart. No, in Christ we are all one. All those things fall away. Um, it reminds me of something N.T. Wright once said that, you know, Jesus wrote the music and Paul is the first great conductor, right? So, so Jesus makes it very clear that our unity in Christ is like the unity of that vine in John 15. And Paul then is the one who goes out around the Mediterranean trying to help people live out that unity, the unity that we have in Christ, and grasp it because we so easily fall into, into division and tribalism. So... He goes on in verse 21. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. We are to remain in Christ. Again, the beginning of John 15 where he talks about the vine. Um, people should see in the Christians, in the Christian community, love, faith, harmony, unity, peace, kindness, compassion, things that the world at large really want, right? That's why we have, to, we have to be aware of how we live and how we act and the things that we say. That we have to do all we can to be Christ-like in our lives every day. It's just, it's just part and parcel of it. Shouldn't be a burden. Should we, we shouldn't feel that way because it's not a burden. Verse 22. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me, so that they may be brought to what? Complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus himself says, look, How will the world come to me, Jesus says, by seeing the unity in the church? That's what's so sad about divisions among Christians, needless division. We do have divisions. And sometimes there are disagreements that really do matter because it does matter who Jesus is, right? But we have to be careful because there are a lot of things that we Christians can disagree about, but we can remain even as we disagree about them, remain brothers and sisters in Christ. Classic example, baptism. Do you baptize infants or do you baptize believers or what? You know, when kid, nine-year-olds, whatever. That is something Christians disagree about. We need to be careful about how we speak of those with whom we disagree. Because we are all one in Christ. We are all brothers and sisters in the family of Christ. And the world needs to see that unity a lot more than they need to see the division.
I am, verse 23, I am them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity, then the world will know indeed that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. God so loved the world, John's gospel, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How will people come to know this? They have to come to know this through through Christians, through the body of Christ. Most people do not respond terribly well to theological lectures. <laughs> Most people rightfully want to see the body of Christ being lived out, living out our Christ-likeness. You could say, well, you know, it shouldn't be that way. I don't want to carry that burden or what. But it's just, it's just inescapable. It is inescapable. And it shouldn't, shouldn't feel like a burden. It comes to mind to me that um, very simple little hymn, they'll know we are Christians by our love. There we go. That old, that old song, I mean, it's, it's true. It's, it's simply true. So, verse 24, he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you have loved me when, since when? Since before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, Though the world does not know you, see, and that world idea is, in, in the immediate sense, it is the priests and the Pharisees because they said to them so many times, you think you know God, you think you know the Father, but you don't because if you did, you would embrace me. Because the Father and I are one. What he does, I do. What I do, he, right? So, verse 26, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Wow. What a great summary sentence that is. I have made you known to them. Jesus has revealed to us the truth of God. And, you know, that's, those are words that are easy to hear. They sort of go through and so forth. And you, but step back and ask yourself, what is it Jesus has made known to us about, about God that the Jews already didn't know? He can't go up to them and say, well, I want you to know that God is merciful and gracious and faithful and and filled with loving kindness to the thousandth generation because they'll just open up the scroll of Exodus and say, yeah, wow, we know this. Tell us something we don't know. What they don't know, what they don't know is that the essence of God's nature is love. That God is, in God's very being, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Community of three. Relationships among three. What sort of relationships? Relationships of love. Lover and beloved. The Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father. The Son loves the Spirit and the Spirit loves the Father and the Spirit loves the Son. That's, that's to me, that's the that's the heart of what Jesus reveals to us. So when John later on in, in 1 John writes five times God is love, it's not a sentiment. It's not a cross-stitch thing. It is a truth about the very nature of God's being, that in God's being there is both lover and beloved. And it's when you really grasp that, and you take it within yourself, and then you come to verse 26 and you sort of get it, right? When Jesus prays to the Father, I have made you known to them. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known 
in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them because God invites us to share in this love. And it's easy to, to it's easy to for, it's easy to to get lost in that or to, to lose that in all the struggles of this world and and you know when when deeply apprehensive and anxious times arrive and people who have nukes are threatening something with them I guess it's. You, you have to know and remember who God is and who Jesus is and the nature of what Jesus has accomplished, will accomplish on this cross that we're, that we're coming to um, and the arrival of the kingdom. And you have to rest in that and, and be comforted in that and, and, and just know that the world's ways are not our ways. And God's victory over sin and death has already been won. That's the point of the resurrection. God's victory over sin and death has already been won 2,000 years ago. And and I, I know at times it doesn't feel like it. At times it doesn't look like it. But it's the truth. And the mark of that truth is Jesus' resurrection. I think maybe in class on Sunday or maybe in class yesterday, I referred to a tweet that Timothy Keller put up when he was talking about he is he runs into people who who will tell him, well, you know, I used to be a Christian, but I'm not anymore. And he will go right to the heart of the matter. And they'll say, okay, well, let's talk about how was it that you believed in Jesus' resurrection and now you don't? See, that's the perfect, that's the perfect point. Everything else is, er, swirls around that point. Because if Jesus was truly resurrected, it changes everything. If he wasn't resurrected, then nothing has changed. And we are lost in sin and darkness. So that right there, that right there, that is the, that is the heart of the matter. That's why I end up talking about resurrection so much. So, that's, that's Jesus' prayer. John 17. No prayer like it in the rest of the New Testament. Nowhere in the other Gospels. And you don't get many, much of Jesus' personal prayers in the Gospels. But you get this one. Besides the Lord's Prayer, this is it. And there's a lot more than the Lord's Prayer has here. Okay, so, any other? Scott, I just see a comment there that uh, John Henson put that um, he highly recommends that N.T. Wright's book, Paul, which I yes. know you do. Yes, indeed. I can even show you the cover of the book. I know where it is. I, I have a whole, I have a pa big Paul shelf, and then I have an N.T. Wright shelf. They kind of run into each other. But this is what the book looks like. Or at least it did. Is this Wright that Paul. a heavy book we carried back from San Diego? Or was that a different one? I, I, think that, I don't think that's it. That would, that's a different that's one. That's another N.T. Is... Wright, but it's gigantic. Well, it's about N.T. Wright's book. I'll show you that one. That one's, that one's massive. This one, I need a forklift. <laughs> <laughs> this, these are a bunch of scholars responding to N.T. Wright's scholarly work, The Faithfulness of God, which is in three volumes, two volumes, up on my shelf up there. You can hear that one as I set it down. <laughs> but this one is by N.T. Wright, and it is his effort to write basically a biography of Paul. And, of course, you have to make assumptions about dates and stuff to do all of that, but he's a pretty informed guy, and um, John has read it, I've read it, other people have read it. I believe that in the fall... It is going to be a big part of the fall back-to-school sermon series that we're going to do on Paul. I think that's the case. 
I, I was kind of hiding from Omicron, and so I missed a, a couple meetings uh, on it. But I think that's coming in the fall. But anyway, the book is excellent, and um, it's available. You can, if you prefer to listen to a reader read it to you, it's also available on Audible. Well, how's that for a bunch of commercials right here? Okay. Death be not proud. Death is short-lived, Susan Hauser writes. Yes, that is... You know, uh, uh, Christians, we must not see death the way other people do. The world doesn't get this, but we must. We must understand that death is death is short lived. It is it is a bridge. It is the enemy. Don't think death isn't the enemy. It is it is the enemy. Because it creates such separation and grief among those who love each other. But it is short-lived. It is, it is not our end. For there is a life after death, and to God's glory, a life after life after death, to use a phrase I got from N.T. Wright, a life of resurrection, of new embodiment, as Jesus was newly embodied when he was resurrected, a body that is transformed and so forth. So we may, I don't know, my next, when we finish John, I may do, since I'm going to be in Isaiah on Mondays for a long time, and I'm probably going to stay in the New Testament, we may do 1 Corinthians, which will give me an opportunity to do 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and get it down in podcasts, which, by the way, are doing well. I've got a meeting tomorrow on the podcast, see if the church can help more with the podcast stuff, because we are about to close in on 50,000 podcast downloads. Right now, they're running, for some reason, that's ticked up, and we're doing maybe 2,200, 2,300 podcast downloads a month right now. Maybe more than that. It was funny on Sunday somebody who works at the church said to us as we were leaving, she was turning the light off for bed and her husband said to her, oh, I'm in bed with Scott and Patty. I mean, I'm listening to them on a podcast. <laughs> that, Kay, that was Kay Myers telling us about her lawyer husband, Paul. How he was it in was bed so listening. Funny. He's in bed with Scott and Patty. <laughs> that happens a lot. I'm just saying it's a, it's a glorious thing. It really is. I never expected that to happen. I just started the podcast because I figured out, well, wait, I could do this. And it was a way for people who missed class to listen for the week they missed. But it's kind of turned into something else. And now if the church really gets behind it and does some big things with, because I've got a number of books of the Bible that are now the whole thing. We're going to talk a lot about Revelation this summer, at least encourage people to 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 spend some time with Revelation this summer. And I've got a whole 20-week 20 episode series on Revelation from the first word to the last. Okay, so now we're going to move to John, John 18. Jesus is going to be arrested. So, I have a little bit of time left, so let's 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 do this, okay? Cuz I I brought some slides that I want to show with you. But let we got to read it carefully. Okay? So go ahead and turn to 18, verse 1. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples, crossed the Kidron Valley. I'll lay that out for you. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. The garden is unnamed. The other Gospels refer to that garden as the Garden of Gethsemane. There's no reason to think that John has a different garden in mind. Not really. There just isn't. Um, it's interesting that he refers to the Kidron Valley by name, but not the garden by name. Because Gethsemane just means, um, guess what? There are olive trees there and an olive press. That's really all it means. But the Kidron Valley is this valley on the eastern side of Jerusalem that David crossed when he was having to flee because his son Absalom had rebelled against him. And some people wonder if, if, if that is what connecting Jesus, the son of David, with David 
and um, the darkness that David was facing as he had to flee Jerusalem with the darkness that Jesus is facing here as he is about to be arrested. I don't know. Some people want that. People like to wonder about stuff like that. So let me let me talk a little bit about the Garden of Gethsemane because I brought some maps and photos. Okay, my good friends. I noticed ah. a number of people who are here with us today have been there with us. Cool. Yeah. The Garden of Gethsemane. So you you can see it on the right there. The arrow pointing to it. Um, that is where Jesus is going to head. The If you look, I should have circled it, I guess, but look just a little bit on the southeast side of, of this line drawing of Jerusalem, you'll see Kidron Valley. Okay, so it's this valley. It's not much of a valley, I have to say. <laughs> It's more like a, it's more like a depression, uh, like a culvert or something, maybe running along the eastern side of the city. But the Garden of the Valley, Garden of Gethsemane, is down in that valley, and on the other side of the valley, is a is a, is the Mount of Olives. It's kind of a ridge, type mountain that runs along the eastern side. So this is a photo of the Kidron Valley, and you're looking from south to north, the city wall. Um, will emerge as it curves around to the left on the left side of your photo. And the center of the camera, you see that structure that you can sort of make out that it's got some mosaics above the arches there. That's the gar that's the um, uh, Church of All Nations. That is the Garden of Gethsemane. So basically, somebody would just leave the city on the eastern side and take this little walk, not long at all, just kind of walk down the hillside into the Kidron Valley and across to the Garden of Gethsemane because that's, that's where it is right there. Um, this is another picture looking up the Garden, Kidron Valley with the city wall to the left. And if you see that, um, see the those domed structures just to the right? And if you moved a little bit further further to the right, you would be able to see the Garden of Gethsemane. Because if I go back to this one, you can see the dome structures on the left side of the photo and the Garden of Gethsemane on the right. Yes. Okay, yes. so now the dome structures are there, so the Garden of Gethsemane is just off the photo to the right. The Church of All Nations is the church that had the giant rock in it. Yes, the that rock is. Where, um, Jesus, it's remembered as the rock where Jesus prayed. Jesus prays, right. That, come, that story coming out of the Synoptic Gospels. Because you don't get that story in John's Gospel. Instead, you got the long discourse. Okay, so this is just on the far right of the photo, you can see a little bit of the front of the Church of All Nations with the yeah, little gold little gold there at the yes. top. So this is the portion of the uh, Gethsemane. Um, that is on one side of the Church of All Nations. There's more of it on the other side. And if you go to the left side of the photo, there's a roadway there, a little bit of a street. And if you cross that street, there's more of the Garden of Gethsemane on the other side. Because it, it was an olive grove. It was a money-making business at the time. And it still got olive trees. Um, sometimes they ask if the olive trees there are the olive trees that were there because they do live a long time. They do get very gnarly, but probably not. I mean, 2,000 years is a heck of a long time. <laughs> a heck of a long time. So um, this is the front of the Church of All Nations with olive trees on the left and olive trees on the right. Um and if you go inside there, I guess I should have, maybe I included that photo. Well, there is there is the church. I don't think I included a photo of the rock, of the stone itself. But but um, you go in there and there's typically people praying in there. Sometimes you can't get in there much because there are services going, going on. Um, and then I found this photo from 2007. This was our first trip to Israel um, oh. with about 30 people. There you can see the olive trees in the back 
in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, so my question is, I, I, I just have to ask this question. Robert looks much different today. I look much different today. Patty, on the other hand, does not look different at all. Oh, I do. And I want to know what Patty, <laughs> what the heck are we talking about? You're funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what it's hard to believe about? this May will be the 15th anniversary of our first trip to yeah. Israel. And we try to still get together with those folks. We do. We Once see every month yeah, or every yeah, other month. We it's do. So, a little small subgroup. We had about yes. thirty people for right. that trip, and then in two thousand eleven, we did basically the same trip, but with sixty people. sixty people, and then we started doing land trips yes. and things. So, yes. So wow, a lot of you yeah. know. I know some of you have been. If you ever get the opportunity to go, you should. We're doing another trip this fall. Just help me get the word out about this fall's trip because that. It really is. I'm I'm confident it's going to happen. Um, I I don't think COVID or the um, uh, uh, trouble in Eastern Europe will will affect that trip. I think will be well. Those will be kind of in the review mirror by then. So in any event, there we go. So back to. Okay, so here's what I think we should do, really. Why would I start this whole business? I don't know. So let's just look back at chapter 18, verse 1. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples. Okay. He crossed the Kidron Valley, and on the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. And maybe we'll just leave it there for next week. What do you think, Patty? That sounds good. Should I go a little further? Well, once you get into the next sentence or so, you're kind of in the middle of the story because the... Maybe we'll make it a more of a cliffhanger. Okay. Verse 2. <laughs> <laughs> now Judas... Ah, Judas Iscariot. That Judas. Remember the bunch of Judases in Jesus' day. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples, which tells you what... That Jesus isn't going there to hide. He's going to a place he's been many times. I mean, it's right outside, basically right outside the city walls. If you're in the Garden of Gethsemane, you can just look up and see anybody coming down the hillside through the big eastern gate down there to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is not, this is no big secret or anything. If he wanted to hide and escape what's coming, that would be easy because he would just cross over the Mount of Olives to the eastern side and disappear into the vast, vast, vast Judean wilderness. But Judas knew this place, of course. Verse 3, so Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. These are all Jews. These are temple soldiers. These are not Roman soldiers. They're not involved yet. This is all coming from the temple. Um, and the priests have temple police, maybe we'll think about it that way, who help to keep the peace. Detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees, the opponents, the capital W world that Jesus has been talking about. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. And Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, John writes, wise, wide open. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, and he says, I am he. Which in the Greek could be simply, yeah, that's me. But, oh my, 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 my. No, there's, there's weight here. I am, remember, is the name of God given to Moses at the burning bush. Jesus says, Ego a me, I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the, tra the traitor was standing there with them. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. The arresting party knows that this is no ordinary arrest. 
This is no ordinary event. This is no ordinary man that they have come to seize and take back to the priests. And when we come together next week, we will pick up there with the arrival of the arresting party and their readiness to fall to the ground at the feet of Jesus. It's remarkable. Okay? So I think Patty's going to come around now. Okay, so do you do you think that when it says that, just one quick question, uh -huh. when, when it says um, they drew back and fell to the ground, is that is it necessarily the guards or could it be the those that were standing around Jesus, his disciples, could they have been the ones that fell to the ground? Well, who are we talking about in the immediate three sentences before? We're talking about a detachment of soldiers, some officials, the chief priests and Pharisees carrying torches, lanterns, and, G and weapons. He, he says, who is it you want? They, that would clearly be the arresting party. Mm -hmm. Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus says. And they drew back and fell to the ground. If you drop out some of the intervening stuff. So it is them. It is the arresting party. Because... They just know that there's this is this this is not ordinary. Jesus right. is no ordinary, no ordinary man. And you know and the sad thing is, they're gonna go ahead and arrest him. Anyway. Yeah. And they're gonna turn him over to the Ro Romans. You know, people have such, such, such a a readiness to protect really themselves. Their world. That's what the that's what the priests and the Sadducees are about. They don't they don't want any of this Messiah talk. They're fat and happy. They think they have all the answers, and they don't want somebody coming saying no. Right. You don't, right. because if you don't know me, you don't know God. Yeah. So wow. Well, okay. So we're gonna pick up there with that right in that arrest next week. I guess they also know that there would be severe consequences if they did not do what they were. No, well, that's to do. A, that as well. Fear is a powerful which a powerful I, motivator. Um, I I absolutely believe there's lots of these little young Russian soldiers who do not want to be doing what they're doing. It seems that many of them are quite surprised. Yes, and you know that they just, were going down there to do drills or other things and and yeah. are are quite surprised to find out that they're going to invade and kill Ukrainians. So, yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. Just a lot of reminders, a lot of theology we could talk about around all of that, and I guess we will in coming weeks. And remember that as in John's Gospel, now that we are coming to the rest, you see, Wednesday's Ash Wednesday. Yes. So as we walk through Lent, we will be in John's Gospel. Right. All the way, you know, to the end. And it'll, it's kind of wonderful how it's matching up yes, that way. it is. As preparation for Holy Week. Did you do that on purpose? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. well, oh, no. Just lucky, I guess. <laughs> just lucky. Maybe it's a God thing. <laughs> yes. Thanks, guys. Thanks for um, being here with us today. We hope to see you, uh, some of you, um, maybe all of you, tomorrow night. Uh, again, Lauren is going to be delivering the message. I know Scott's one of the pastors that's going to be doing Ashes. And, of course, we'll be there on Sunday. I mean, that's kind of a thing like, wow, we're doing this. And then Sunday with uh, live communion. It's, you know, in-person communion. That's all without coming little back. baggies and stuff. It's kind of cool. So, and we will be back in Tuesday in Pero very quite soon. soon. Very, quite soon. Very I'm soon. having a meeting tomorrow on it. We just got to make sure that they really have set the technology pieces. It's up correctly. That's so, right. and I think Lauren will test that out for us <laughs> first. I guess I may class. be first to use it. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll I'm going to ask John tomorrow. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you, God, for all the, all of those that are with us today. We pray, God, for each one of us, and we pray, God, that you would not watch only over us. We pray, God, for our families, and we pray for our friends. We pray, God, that you would keep us safe. We pray, God, that you would hold us close, that we would feel your presence, and, Lord, that we would be seeking your presence. We also pray, God, for your wisdom and your discernment in our lives to help us make 
good choices every day, Lord, to live more Christ-like, God, each day. We pray, God, for all that is going on in the world right now. We pray, God, for your peace, please, to pass through this world, your peace that passes understanding. We pray for those that are suffering right now in Ukraine, Lord. We pray for smart, smart heads to um, be making the very important decisions, God, that are being made right now that affect Ukraine and possibly, you know, all of the world. We love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your guidance, your love, and the gift of your son, Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Bye, adios, folks. everybody. See you soon. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Bye. Bye-bye. Fat Tuesday. Fat Tuesday. Fat Scott. Don't say that. <laughs> Get out your beads. <laughs>